Welcome to Arkham Postcast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? Doing well this uh, evening. I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited, man. We've got the uh, the new logo for the website. We've we've transitioned from my placeholder, and I'm I'm just really happy to see it today. I think we're gonna go through. Uh, uh, we're we're gonna have our third episode. You excited for that? Absolutely. I'm excited about the new logo, the new brand. It's it's uh it's. I was excited what Sean delivered to us. So uh, we'll see what people think here. Uh, should we jump right into news? Go for it. Yeah, I'll let you lead off with that one. All right, so we this week we have a couple news items uh, around uh, Bitwarden and Riot and Nextcloud. Uh, jumping into it here, we have uh, Riot. I am changing its name to Element. Big brand, big rebrand from them is what I describe it as. What I think uh, we talked about a little, but this is the second rebrand for them. I think you mentioned earlier it was uh, renamed from Vector with the matrix back end to riot which it previously was now it's over to element um i think with that they got a new ui update and a a, a brand overhaul i don't know if i would call it that but um to a degree that's kind of what it is yeah and, and like you said this is the second time they've done that i i still maintain that it's the second best name that they've come up with uh, i i did really like vector so element is their official client there are other clients out there as well uh, so this is the Matrix team's uh, official brand. There, there are plenty of other clients out there as well, but this is the one, like you said, that they are putting forward. Um, kind of jumping into Bitwarden RS, they just released multi-architecture support for their, their Docker image. Now, rather than pulling down a specific architecture, uh, you're able to pull their latest image as 1.16.0. Uh, pretty exciting there. Third here, we have uh, Bitwarden, the upstream repo, or the upstream project. Uh, finally did their 2020 security audit. I shouldn't say finally. Uh, they do it biannually is what it sounds like, so every two years. Something to report on that. Uh, a little excerpt we have from the audit was that during the test performed by the Insight Risk Consulting Team, which was a third party they hired to do their audit, no exploitable vulnerabilities were discovered, and two issues of moderate severity were highlighted. These results are very positive, especially given the extensive size and complexity of Bitwarden's overall infrastructure. With this being said, we use the Rust version, just to clarify this uh, a little bit more. The community version. Right, right. So this is the actual Bitwarden upstream project. So it was good to see that they had that audit. Uh, I think it kind of trickles through the community. I'm, I'm very excited, very pumped to see that. It's, it's, it's good. If they're going over security audit, sure, they're going to have different code than the community implementation that we're using, but they're using the same architecture. I mean, they're using a one-to-one -one API parity with the upstream project. Now, for instance, if we go back to the Panera hack of, what was that, 2015, 2016, right, where yeah. uh, users could be enumerated, and uh, once you logged into your account, you could uh, literally change in. A, a number in the URL and get someone else's account details because they started at one and just kept counting up. It wasn't pseudo random, uh, so it wasn't secure. Uh, so that being like an architectural function, if something like that came up in the Bitwarden security audit, not only would the Bit Warden upstream benefit from from fixing that issue, but all the unofficial implementations, including this Rust one, uh, would also be able to to hop on that fix and implement that as well, uh, because it is an, an architectural where where the security audit would would catch that as well. Exciting, exciting to see. Uh, and then we'll move here. The next next cloud conference of 2020 was announced. Essentially, the date is the third and fourth of October. Uh, it's going to be virtual, but go figure, right? Yeah, uh, 2020, man. 2020. Have you have you been to any of the virtual conferences yet? How I have not. No, I'm, I've been so lazy. I, have you gone to one? Have you gone to any of them? So my entire team at work signed up for the the Red Hat 2020 virtual summit. Uh, and okay. I think we all started to to watch something, and then we got a P one for like the next two days. Uh. <laughs> so that was <laughs> that was my introduction. Hey, that, 
that's what uh youtube's for right you just go back and look at all the uh <laughs> talks yeah. that you want to see well and and part of that too that that they're trying to push is getting involved in the community during that so like being in chat rooms uh, being available, right, and and kind of putting yourself a little more out there than you would when you're at a regular conference. Like, I can just sit in a chair and, like, be on my computer, and that doesn't really put me in the middle of what's going on in the conference, where what's going on in the conference now is going to be not in the the, the grand hall or, or the, the vendor's location. It's going to be in the chat rooms. It's going to be the in chat, the community. Yeah. It's going to be on Twitter, too. It's going to be, you know... Any kind of communi- two-way communication is going to be definitely boosted during this time. So, And then you want to give our bonus item there while we're talking about community and everything? Yeah, I found a little hidden gem that I wasn't able to report on uh, in the last episode. But NextCloud have launched their podcast for all of you podcast junkies out there like myself. Uh, it is a deeper dive into what makes NextCloud great uh, and how the guys behind it uh, work and how they do it. So it's it was a it was a fun listen to to see where their heads are at, and I am excited to see what's coming next. I think they have about two episodes out right now, waiting for a third soon, and hopefully they keep rolling from there. Awesome, yeah. And then uh, I think that wraps it up for news. You want to hop into uh, our composed developments? So the first one is around Cron. Now I ran into uh, a, a kind of a catch recently where. The, the cron job that I was running ran fine in the shell when I was executing it manually, but when I went to put it on that schedule, it just wasn't. You know, something something wasn't coming back right. And with cron, it's very hard to debug, uh, to get an output log, something like that. You really have to start changing stuff. So when I was trying to figure out what was going on with this cron job, uh, I, was, I was taking a look around, and it seemed like I wasn't executing in the environment that I expected to, right? So uh, looking around on the internet, I found a very good article that kind of outlines that. Um, And I quote from uh, dev.to, when you normally run a shell script, it runs under the context of your user profile's shell settings. So it knows which shell executor to use, the programs that are available in your path, environment, variable, etc. However, when you run the same script with crontab, you may have a different context or environment variables. It's best to specify these explicitly so that others in your future self can understand your state of mind and thinking if they ever look into it. So I was going back and trying to figure out what happened there. And uh, what I found is that the command it was trying to call was outside of the path environment variable that cron sets. And to quote from Linux eyes, the default path is set to user bin and bin. If the command you are executing is not present in the cron specified path, you can either use the absolute path of the command or change the cron path variable. So trying to find a workaround, the the simplest thing was to, in the cron tab itself, specify that path, which ended up being uh, user sbin, and executing the program that way. Uh, and, And I set the path actually to the full path that root is allowed, since I wanted to make sure if that made any other subsequent calls that it would be in the path as well. So I wouldn't get any kind of unexpected behavior there. Uh, so that was just a you know learning experience for me. I've been administering Linux systems for going on 10 years now. And that's just one of the gotchas that you're going to run into probably two or three times in your career before you really internalize it. Uh, so so that was, that was a, a humbling experience for me. Uh, I did also get something else completed, which was very nice to see. So we obviously use a lot of Docker containers and we use the upstream as much as possible. So we're constantly dealing with their updates and figuring out when we have a newer version available for us to use. We have been doing that manually up till now. Now it's not, it's not difficult, but it is a chore, right? So all my chores, I definitely try to automate going, going through that. I wanted to have some kind of a report that I could throw together that would show what we're using and then what the Docker upstream is using. So I was able to to throw that together, spits out a nice uh, table. I learned a new Python library, uh, tabular. Is that a pretty out? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just a very pretty okay. standard okay. out. So that was, that was fun to kind of play with at the, the tail end of that. Uh, but the, the, the point that I spent most of my time at was figuring out the recursive function. So, oh man, that yeah. was not to kind of dive into that one a little bit. Yeah. So the, the recursive function isn't, isn't my favorite. 
we were using the Docker Hub API, which was in itself fun to learn. Uh, however, when they returned the list of tags on an image, which would tell us the versions that they, the, the specific images are, when they return that to us, they return it to us paginized, right? Which means that they will give you the first 20 and then give you a link to where you can find the next 20 and so on and so forth until you hit the end. Well, what a recursive function does is it keeps calling itself until it hits that tail end link, right? And then it builds up the entire list basically collapsing in on itself, almost like an inception. It just closes right back, yeah. back in on itself. So, uh, I was going through and, and writing that, and, and it's just a very mind-mangling process to go through, to think in such a way where you recurse to a level until something gets done and return a result. So once I was able to figure that out, getting the rest of the tags and doing the logic to parse the versions, et cetera, was, was fairly straightforward. I think I... I could have refactored the code, uh, but since it's internal right now, if anyone wants to send a PR my way that cleans it up a little bit, there is definitely a link in the show notes. Absolutely. Yeah, that that recursive function is not something easy to wrap your brain around because no. in computer science, everything's, you know, you write a script, everything's pretty linear. You tell the computer to do this, it does this. You got to tell it to find that base case and you don't know how long that function is going to run for. So that recursion always keeps you on your toes, uh, keeping you on your toes, I'd say. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, do we want to hop into our integration discussion here? I think today we're going to talk about Camboard. I think I, I saw our overview and I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to dive right in here. You know, Camboard uh, is, is near and dear to my heart. I'm going to go over the introduction as well as the overview of, of Camboard that I wrote up. And we are going to, to run through the documentation and see if there's any improvements we can make here. So to start off in the overview... Uh, I would say that the Canboard software is meant to track what tasks are in which state. A good introduction can be found at the Canboard project's official documentation site. So if you would indulge me, I will actually hop over there uh, for a few and, and go through that so we can have at least a baseline of what we're talking about here. So on their documentation, on their user's guide, they, they ask the question, what is Kanban, right? So Kanban, the answer, is a methodology originally developed by Toyota to be more efficient. There are only two constraints imposed by Kanban. One is to visualize your workflow and the other to limit your work in progress. To dive into the first part there to visualize your workflow, uh, your work is displayed on a board so that you have a clear overview of your project. And it's a board with rows and columns and, and we have uh, tasks indicated by they get little sticky notes, little post-it notes. Um, and those are moved around the board to indicate different things. And we'll dive into those in a second. Uh, each column represents a step in your workflow. And typically the workflow is meant to flow from the leftmost side of the board to the, the rightmost side of the board. So once it reaches the last column, uh, that would indicate typically a, a done status of a task. Um, now, the, the other constraint that Kanban implements here is to limit your work in progress. Uh, so that encourages focus by avoiding multitasking. We want to make sure we're working on the things we're working on. Uh, each phase, each column here can have work in progress limits. Uh, and by doing so, it helps to identify bottlenecks and avoid working on too many tasks at the same time. But how do we measure performance, right? So... So Kanban has two kind of key indicators. Uh, they use the lead time, which would be the time between the task creation and the task completion, and the cycle time, which is the time between the task start and the task completion. Now, that may seem similar, but let's, let's break it down. If I have a client come to me and ask me how long it's going to take to do a task, if I know that my lead time on average for a, a small task, if they're asking me to do a small task, I know on average from the time I put a task on my board to the time it ends that it's two weeks, I can tell them, hey, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be two weeks. And then they can go off and, and I can be confident in giving them an honest answer uh, to, to estimate how long it's going to get them to get a product, right? The cycle time, however, would be the time that I'm actually working on it, right? So... I have a life, you know, I have responsibilities out here and I have other projects that I'm working on at the same time. So I can only dedicate a certain amount of that two weeks to the specific project that I am 
doing for that client. The time when I actually start that task and the time that I complete that task is called the cycle time. That's that's how long it's actually taking me to work that task, where the lead time is from the time that I accept the project to the time that the project is completed. And they feed off each other too, right? And you get a constant feedback loop of how my cycle time influences my lead time and how good my estimations are. If I'm overestimating cycle time, then my lead time start cutting down. Uh, and, and it's just a, a good balancing act right there. It is... It's very beneficial to have a system that tracks those so that we can see if we're getting better or worse or, or how we're doing just internally uh, among ourselves. So, uh, and we, we use that because we're able to do those measurements, right? But we also do that because we've also considered the alternatives, right? And Kanban's documentation has a very good breakdown here. So if we take a look at Kanban versus to-do lists, right? To-do lists, it, well, everyone knows what a to-do list is. It's a list. It's one single list of things you have to do. Now, that's simplifying it. There are uh, systems like the Getting Things Done system or What's Best Next that use multiple lists in different ways, right? But ultimately, a list is a list is a list. And it is little bit more inflexible than I think I'm comfortable with, right? As well, it opens up the door to multitasking, especially if I have a list staring me in the face and I have all the tasks, say it's a weekly list, right? I'm looking at everything I got to get done for a week. That is a lot of things that can quickly become overwhelming, or I could be tempted to take it all on at one point, which is going to be equally as devastating to my productivity. So Kanban avoids doing that by breaking these tasks up into multiple phases in, in the columns and saying that, all right, if I've got three tasks in one step and, and two of them are, are advanced to the next step, right? I can focus on exactly what I want to at any given time, right? It brings that focus to avoid the multitasking, right? By setting that, that limit per column. It's one more flexible and, it, and it's easier to maintain focus using a Kanban system. Almost on the other side of the spectrum is the Scrum methodology. Now, it doesn't use lists as much as it uses a board as well, right? So they are similar in that respect. However, the processes around them are different. Uh, for example, Scrum has the concept of sprints, which are time box uh, units, usually about two or four weeks, uh, in which every task on the board has to be completed. It doesn't allow for the flexibility, I think, that, that Kanban does, and it doesn't yeah. allow for the flow. If, if you think about it, what is my analogous representation in the physical world? A, a whiteboard, say, right? If I have sure. a whiteboard with post-it notes on it, I know I move stuff from left to right in, in a board-type system. That's, that's a given. Now, what I don't do is every two weeks erase the board entirely and recreate it from scratch. Right. That just doesn't make any sense to me. I could I could see the potential benefits of, of reanalyzing the situation, sure, but it does not make sense to me to only wipe down that entire board every two weeks and then reprioritize everything. It has more specific uh, leadership guidelines where there are predefined roles like Scrum Master and Product Owners and then the rest of the team, where Kanban, on the other hand, is, is a more continuous flow where changes are... are fairly easy to make i think kind of hopping in uh basically with scrum i i, I kind of see what we do at our compose is kind of like a hybrid between scrum and kanban leaning a lot more towards kanban than scrum i mean we do have priority meetings and retrospective meetings um but with that we're able to prioritize we're, we're flexible i think is the big difference between scrum and kanban i, I think the difference at least for us, is the flexibility. We're not held absolutely accountable for Scrum or our two-week or four-week period for wiping everything off the board and literally starting brand, brand new and fresh every two or four weeks. We can have outstanding items out there. And having gone over those systems in relation to Kanban, it is a spectrum. Uh, there is the loose-leaf to-do list 
scattered all over the office kind of situation. And then you have the scrum board where no one is allowed to add anything without about three or four meetings of discussion and right? approval from a man and approvals. Right, right, and right. exactly. Yeah. So, so it, within that spectrum lies, I think Kanban, uh, and it's just always been a happy medium for me. Uh, and I think it's flexible enough to, to deal with the situations that we find ourselves uh, coming up in. Now I did want to, touch on a couple things that I thought I would have liked to know when I started using Kanban. Sure. I want to, let's hear them. Uh, so besides the Kanban official introduction, uh, there were a couple things to point on. So several key indicators in Kanban that it presents to the user when you're creating new tasks or when you're reviewing existing tasks, um, are as follows. So one is the assignee, which is the person who is responsible for taking action on the task as it stands right now. Uh, and that can also be changed over the life cycle of a task. If, uh, if we have a state where, well, we do have a state, Jack and I, uh, a review column. And when that, when a task gets put into that review column, if that's something that I need Jack to review, I will absolutely assign it to him, even though I did all the work. At that point in the life cycle of the task, it is on his shoulders to complete the work that needs to be accomplished. To review, right. right. Yeah, so at that point, he is the assignee. He is the person who is responsible for taking action on that task, right? Uh, and next is the state, which is whether this task needs to be worked on, reviewed, or followed up on. So like I said before, I mean, we have a review state. We also have have a waiting state we have a planning state so there are a couple that we utilize i'm actually going to dive into that in our next episode so stay tuned uh, next is our description so this is probably the most important and most underutilized field when you're creating a task and i think it really comes down to three things i wrote here that this is the initial rationale or reason for a task to be done this should describe the desired outcome as well as a high level outline of what it might take to get there. So, so there are your three points, right? So there's the why, the reason or the problem that you encountered, uh, the end state or what determines when it's done. Like what is, right. what is the done condition? Taking a step back and saying, all right, what is this actually gonna be to, to done? When, when is this actually gonna be done? And what is outside of the scope of this that needs to be categorized as a, a explicit something else. Right. Right. Uh, and then the last part of it is just a high level outline of what it might take to get there. So it is important that, that I just don't dump something in Jack's lap and say, Hey, I got a task for you to, uh, to fix this. And he's like, I don't even know where you want me to start looking. Right. So, so giving, giving an initial boost there, even if it's for myself, just to jot down some notes for myself, what I think I might want to start researching first or, or how I might go about this is going to be beneficial. Uh, and then the last key indicator I would say is the due date. So it's, it's a date field like any other date field for a task. Uh, typically it's used to indicate that a task needs to be completed by set date or that an event related to that task will be occurring on a set date. Now, I use it in, in that manner, which is a little bit more fluid than what a due date actually is. Um, typically, I use it to say, hey, I'm helping my buddy move uh, on Saturday. So that's the due date for that task. Now, I also set the due date for the show notes that Jack and I produce for this show. Right. That right. is an actual due date and says you need to have this completed by that date, not that the event of moving will be on that due date. Maybe if it becomes an issue, Camboard also has a start date field. So if there is something that needs to be started before it's due, that field could be utilized as well if you want to get a little bit more granular. Up front, I just want to keep it simple. I'm just using due date and it's been working out just fine for me. Now there are several other optional fields that can provide valuable information on a given task. Uh, one is a priority and we actually use this in conjunction with swim lanes uh, or the, the rows of the board. This is basically how urgent it is that the task gets done. I'd call it criticality. What's the criticality of the task? So along with criticality, right, comes complexity. So, so we know how quickly we need to address this, but how long and how much effort is it going to take to address this? 
so this this complexity or or some people use it as a just a straight up time estimate it provides an upfront way to show how much work will be required to complete the task now this is something i'll be going into a little bit more in depth next week how we uh, complexitize our tasks and and determine how we rate those and and categorize those um, but it is something that's a little bit more touchy-feely than say a date it's a little more arbitrary uh, and the last one here is category so this is a good way to indicate that this task is part of a bigger project or linked to other tasks somehow in a logical grouping um, typically if i have a big task to complete i'm gonna i'm gonna create it more as a as a category and then break different tasks out and and associate them with that category so that when the when all the tasks are done i can consider that overarching project done as well most of those are going to have separate pages in the Canboard book that we maintain at Bookstack, uh, which is compositionalenterprises.rcompose.com slash Bookstack. And we will be updating that as we go through this Canboard series. Uh, but I did want to touch on two more things here uh, relevant to Canboard. Once again, things I wish I knew when I started. Uh, one of them being board scope. How do we determine which board to use, right? So if, if you think of it, going back to our analogy in the real world, if I have a whiteboard, right? My temptation is just to use one giant massive board for everything. Fortunately or unfortunately, Camboard offers us the ability to create a near infinite amount of boards. So we have to figure out what is the happy medium between one giant board for everything and a bunch of little happy boards for everything. I've come up with three questions that I ask myself every time that I come up with a new widget that we want to to create. And does it go on this board or do we need a new board for it? So uh, question number one is, does the same workflow apply? Uh, question number two, are the same group of people going to use this board? And number three, is the same visibility needed? Does it need to be public rather than private or private rather than public? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, then a new board should be created for the project under consideration. Otherwise, there is no reason to not continue to use the same board. Uh, it, it becomes overwhelming very quick uh, to have to context switch between boards. And as well, it loses one of the, the key tenets of a Kanban system, right, which is to visualize your workflow. If you're not right. able to visualize it in a single pane of glass or, or by looking at one or at, at max two different boards, right, then you've already lost your productive edge. Keeping it as tight as possible is going to maintain that benefit for you and just ultimately create a more cohesive experience. If you have the thought in your head that something you're going to do is going to need a new board, that you're going to create a new board to do some kind of grand experiment, uh, then I would ask yourself, does the same workflow apply? Are the same group of people going to use the board? And is the same visibility needed? I really like it. Right now, I think uh, just kind of a quick riff off that. We have our one board right now for software development. And I think in the near future is what I'll say is we're going to we're gonna create a second one here for kind of our sales and uh, customer relationship. Yeah, definitely good questions to ask before deciding whether or not to go with a new board or staying with the existing one. Absolutely. Uh, and then the last thing here, we've kind of been tiptoeing around, but I wanted to kind of explicitly state what our workflow is or, or what the basic workflow is. So uh, there are two things, there are columns and rows. In, in our board here. So we would call the columns, we would call them states of the task, but the, what is the state of the task? Now the basic workflow consists of several columns to indicate the state of the task. Typically a task is moved from the leftmost column to the rightmost column, like we were talking about earlier, as it progresses through the states. The most basic setup consists of three states, to do, doing, and done. This can be expanded, renamed, and altogether mangled based on the project requirements. Yeah, I think we're going to get a little bit into that next week. I'm, I'm hoping so, at least. Our next week's chat is going to be around the initial configuration. 
so we are absolutely going to get into what board am I going to create? Like, what is my workflow going to be? We're going to go over if I need to, you know, if, if I need to put together a software development workflow, what is that going to look like? If I need to put together a management workflow or sales pipeline, what is that going to look yeah. like? Uh, and, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm very excited to, to dive into that in in oh, great well, detail. Me there too. too. Me too. Uh, now the the next aspect of the the workflow would be the rows or or as we call them the swim lanes. So these are the horizontal rows in which tasks can be categorized. A good rule of thumb is that tasks that are put into swim lanes on top are in some way more important than tasks that are put into lower swim lanes. While these are not strictly necessary, a basic board should start with at least two swim lanes. One being the critical swim lane and the other being the everything else swim lane. This serves to highlight the old adage that if everything is critical, then nothing is critical and forces the users to a modicum of prioritization right from the start. Having those two blocks, uh, once once those are well thought through and architected and implemented, uh, you are well on your way to to a solid uh, tool to to help you with your your workflow. Yeah, as a kind of one line summary, it's task management. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, anything else to add? Yeah, Andrew, let's hear uh, if you had uh, any final words, any conclusion, any quick conclusion you need have to give on uh cam board anything that you think that anyone should absolutely know what do you think it'd be since you prop that door wide open <laughs> i'm gonna finish up with kind of use examples now one obviously software development as we're using it right now um, it gets us a a good indication of when something's ready to be deployed uh, what each of us is responsible for and what we can expect to be done uh, within a reasonable amount of time the next one is is bug tracking, still in the software development realm, uh, but tracking issues or following up on projects that are having some some problems and, and need to get done. Uh, sales is another good example that I've seen used a lot, dealing with leads, meetings, different proposals and purchases uh, that are all part of that sales pipeline can be tracked through a Kanban board. Um, business management as well, tracking ideas and doing measurement and analysis of, of these, these business proposals, how, how they work out in the real world is very well highlighted in a Kanban software type model. Uh, same goes for the recruiting process, uh, online shops with orders, packaging, shipping, and even manufacturing, you know, to, to loop it back to where it all started. This framework really can accommodate a lot of different workflows. Uh, I think the single pane of glass and the focus that it brings is very beneficial to to any type of productivity that you're trying to eke out of yourself or others. You want to hop into uh, containers here? Take it away, Jack. I'm going to give a brief overview on containers uh, today, kind of go over what they are, how they work, uh, some of the benefits, and then next week we'll kind of dive into Docker uh, a little bit more on that and how we use it at our compose. Um, but kind of getting into it here, uh, what is a container? You have to ask yourself. It's the new hot trend of technology, I guess I'd say. Everyone's on board. Came out, uh, what, I'd say probably 2010s here. Um, there were two features, two Linux kernel developments that kind of made this technology possible. But as a brief overview, containers are a better way to create, package, and deploy software across different environments uh, in a predictable and easy to manage way. Is that a hot take? I would say yes. But honestly, after using it, I am sold. I am so sold on this. It is so easy to deploy and package uh, software. I, 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 don't, I couldn't imagine going any other way. Um, I'm sure you might be in the same boat uh, just based on how often we spin up and blow away uh, VMs nowadays. Um, but containers kind of getting more into it are an operating system virtualization. It's a, an easy way to package applications and dependencies and then run them in is their own isolated environments. With that OS virtualization, it's way more lightweight than a VM. Essentially with that, you're getting single applications instead of entire OSs. Uh, so deploying on any infrastructure actually is 
pretty simple. It's made very easy. Uh, essentially, you need the one, the one piece of technology, underlying technology, and then you can take your images and containers and run them across multiple devices, making horizontal scalability a breeze. The format also ensures dependencies are baked into uh, these images, is what they're called. And then um, it also allows uh, kind of a standard standardization across infrastructure. Um, I kind of touched on that a little bit, but scalability and management is just so much easier with this. You're not chasing down environments and environment variables and dependencies, um, just a much smoother process. Kind of with that, you have to ask yourself, what's the difference between a container and a VM? So containers take kind of that different approach. Uh, rather than virtualizing the entire computer, the hardware, and the operating system, they essentially take the operating system directly. They run specialized processes managed by the host operating system's kernel, but with a super constrained view and a heavily manipulated view, is what I'd call it, of systems processes, the uh, resources, and the environment. Containers are basically unaware they exist on a shared system and they operate as if they're in full control of the computer. So basically when you run these processes, it doesn't know it exists on a host. So the two technologies that make this possible are Linux C groups and namespaces. We'll kind of dive into them here real quick. Uh, so C groups are a kernel feature that allow processes and the resources to be grouped, isolated, and managed as a unit. C groups bundle process together to and then determine which resources they can access, and then they provide a mechanism for managing and monitoring their behavior. So a lot of this is just, it's resource constraining. Mm, there you go. On single units. So what what uh, C groups uh, story do you have for us? So how, how have you used C groups? I already told you. Oh, I know that, but I, you got to tell everyone else. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> in my day job, we work with Ansible a lot, and we were running into a situation where Ansible was just eating a whole bunch of memory yeah, so it was it was running out of memory, and the, the the host itself was running out of memory, and that was causing all kinds of problems with the system, up to actually crashing the system. So we had to figure out what was going on. But every time I kicked off a run, my server would crash, and the the process would crash, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So um, what I was able to do is actually run the process inside of a C group, which constrained the amount of memory and CPU that it was able to utilize. I was able to run it in a controlled environment where it didn't have to, uh, where, where it failed quickly, right? It had a limited scope of RAM. Yeah, doing those tests, I was able to uh, limit the, the scope of what I was actually running against. I didn't have to run against all 10,000 servers at once. I could start with one or two, figure out where it was consuming all of this RAM and all of the CPU and start rabbit trailing down there and, and figure out what was actually causing this issue and, and kind of doing that without affecting everyone else who was on that server. So um, I, I got a lot less grumpy coworkers uh, by doing that. So that definitely paid off big time. Unrelated, but uh, do you think it was a recursive function causing that issue? <laughs> I, uh, I don't think so, but I wouldn't put it past it. And the, <laughs> those things are tricky, <laughs> tricky, tricky. Uh, and then the uh, other feature that was implemented, namespaces were a feature that came out that partition kernel resources, basically so that one set of processes sees one set of resources, while another set of processes sees another set of resources. This doesn't make much sense when I say it like this, but if I give a few examples, it'll be a lot clearer here. So uh, the quick example with namespaces is uh, process ID namespace. So when you start a host operating system, process ID one kicks off and that's the operating system itself. Everything will run underneath that process ID. Uh, the other two that we have are networking namespaces, which allow you to run programs on any port you want without conflicting with what's already running. And then mount namespaces. But uh, mount namespaces basically allow you to mount and unmount file systems without affecting the host file system. Yeah, yeah. so Andrew, you wanna talk about uh, mount namespaces and how you've been using them recently? Uh, give a little uh, tease for next week. I think we'll cover a little bit here today and then a little bit next week. What I was trying to do is to mount volumes into a running container. This is assuming that we understand how, how we're working with containers and, and so on and so forth, but explicitly to exemplify how the mount namespace works. 
If you've used Docker before, you probably know that you can only mount volumes when a container is first created. Uh, after that, the container's namespaces are isolated from the host. So it has a type of isolation. What, what we're trying to do here is mount a file or, or a directory in the host file system into a running container. Now, we know how to do bind mounts. That same technology can be used to mount files within the file system. So why couldn't we just, if everything is a file in Linux, why couldn't we just mount it and have, have the container see it, right? Well, turns out if you do that, when you're looking at the directory from the host, but as soon as you're in the container, they're nowhere to be found. And that's because mounts, like we were going over, are namespaced. If we create a bind mount on the host, it's only available in the host's namespace. As long as it's there, it's not in the container's namespace. Uh, right. it's, it's really another dimension of permission management uh, dealing with these C groups and namespaces. That's a great way to put it. I really like that uh, another dimension because the way I, we'll get into it a little bit more next week, but the way you explained that fix or that hack was just blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. Yep. Um, but basically these two features, C groups and namespaces allow you to pretend you have something like a virtual machine, except it's not a virtual machine at all. It's just processes running in the same Linux kernel. So with that, uh, kind of hopping into Docker a little bit. So, Docker is just a set of tools that allows users to create images, push and pull images from registries, and then run and manage containers in different environments. Kind of real quick here, an image is kind of what I would describe as something that is baked and pre-made. And then our containers are uh, what I would describe as our runtime environment. What stands out to me most about containers is their reproducibility, right? And the right. reproducibility stems from this concept of an image uh, that gets, you know, quote unquote, baked. And that is probably the, the thing that I appreciate most about uh, containers is just the, the ability to reproduce um, errors. If I, if I send something to Jack, he knows um, he's running on the exact same image that I am, and I can tell him exactly how to reproduce an error. Um, and it just makes communicating between each other so much easier. Right. You don't have to deal with the uh, dependency management and environment management, which makes it a heck of a lot easier. I really like the way you described that. Uh, I, I'd say containers are pretty specific, but we'll kind of get into it next week with Docker files uh, as kind of a way to make those images. Um, but uh, with that, I, th there's a, a few benefits of containers. Obviously, lightweight virtualization. We're able to host 13 services at a time on, you know, maybe a, I think we can get all 13 on a four four gig don't don't quote me on this one either but uh thir 13 services on a four four gigabyte host uh which is actually pretty impressive granted uh we're two users running all those services and then with that we get our environment isolation so tools and services can run can run uh independent on their own nothing seeing other variables across a system really the main feature that you kind of talked on already was the standard packaging and the standard runtime environment that allows it to easily scale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you hit the nail right on the head there. But next week, we'll kind of dive into Docker, get into a little bit about Docker files, Docker volumes, uh, kind of the basics with Docker Hub and kind of what we, how we use it and how we have it out there. Any conclusions, anything to add for this week? Uh, no, I mean, we're, we're looking forward. I think we're going to be publishing the, the site with a type of overhaul and and kind of make it public sure. and, and try to start getting the word out so if this is a the last of the first episodes that you're hearing uh, another one will be coming out soon and uh, we're hoping to just keep rolling from there do we have a do you have the uh, concluding note there i do i do oh yep there we go <laughs> <laughs> well to wrap it up we hope you enjoyed this episode of our composed cast thank you be safe and we'll see you all in two weeks